Before we get into this month's iOS developer news stories, remember links for everything you see here can be found in the GitHub repo. The link to that repo is in the description. All right, let's start the rundown and get into it. First up, of course, we have the Apple event where the new iPhone 14, uh, the new Apple Watch Ultra, and iOS 16 is now released. As always, uh, Federico Vitici here has the iOS 16 Mac Storage Review. I feature this pretty much every year for iOS, macOS. He does <laughs> the most thorough job you will ever see. So this is just the cover page. I'm gonna go through one page. As you can see, it's 16 pages. This first one is design. And I'm just gonna, again, scroll through. You can see how detailed it is comparing iOS 15 to iOS 16. Again, I'm gonna go by quick because this is so uh, in depth. Very visual, very thorough. So if you're curious, all the new stuff in iOS 16 and you wanna see a direct side-by-side -side comparison to iOS 15, this is always a must read every year for pretty much all iOS users and especially for developers. Xcode 14 is now available. In fact, I just released my video yesterday, what's new in Xcode 14. I'll link to that in the description as well. Go check that out. But if you haven't downloaded Xcode 14, go ahead and download that now, uh, get up to date. iPad OS, we talked about this last month. Here's the iPad OS 16 preview on apple.com. It has been delayed till October. Usually in previous years, iPad OS and iOS come out at the same time. We hinted at it last month that this was kind of a rumor. It is official iPad OS 16 in October. And this is pretty typical, Mac OS Ventura. That is also coming out in October as well. But like I said, that is usually a month or so behind iOS anyway. And I can't finish off the Apple event story without talking about the bell of the ball, the star of the show. That is the, let me fast forward to it, <laughs> the dynamic island. This thing looks so cool. I'm not gonna lie. I had zero interest in the iPhone 14. I was like, cool, pill shape, great. This little animation and UI experience made me want to get an iPhone 14. I didn't because allegedly iPhone 15 is coming with USB-C, so I'm just gonna hold off for that, but this really uh, had me close to buying it. That thing is awesome. Next up, Xcode Cloud subscriptions are now available. Uh, Xcode Cloud, as you can see, is a continuous integration and delivery service built in Xcode designed expressly for Apple developers. This was announced last WWDC 2021. It was in beta for a while. So the news now is that you can subscribe to it. I guess that means it's out of beta. I'm pretty sure. I guess I should have looked into that. I'm just going on the fly here. But here are the subscription prices uh, that you can see here. I'm not gonna lie, as an indie developer and content creator, I don't really use continuous integration or anything like that. So not too familiar with this. But if you are in my shoes, you're not exactly sure what Xcode Cloud is or does or what the benefits of it are, then I have another link for you here, the Xcode Cloud Toolkit. This is all the stuff that was released last year, right? WWDC 2021, meet Xcode Cloud, explore Xcode Cloud. So again, if you don't quite remember all the details, because again, it was a year ago, uh, here you go. Here's the link to get all caught up. Next, I want to share a tutorial series by the Swift UI Lab. Javier here has a very, very thorough introduction to the Swift UI layout protocol. Now, I believe, I haven't fully dug into this quite yet, so I'm not super knowledgeable on it, but I think as a Swift UI developer, or just an iOS developer in general, knowing this layout protocol uh, very well will, will do wonders for you when it comes to working with your layout. And again, Javier here has it covered with a two-part, very thorough post. You can see here's the table of contents, the basics, advanced layouts. This first post, again, covers the basics. I'll link to both of them. The second post here, so when you get uh, fun animations. Now the animations are cool. It's what makes it visual, makes people intrigued and all that. I'm scrolling down to it. And you know, when are you gonna use animations like this? It's kind of niche. It's not so much about the animations. It's about just knowing how to work with and manipulate the, the layout protocol so you can do you know, whatever you want. So again, an animation like this might be niche. However, something like this down here, I'll get to it. Uh, seems very, well, again, he gets a little little crazy with some of them. Uh, where is that grid animation? Yeah, this one. This one actually looks like it could be very usable in having the grid be dynamic with different sizes and everything like that. So anyway, I'm not going to get too much into it. Very thorough, very in-depth. Highly recommend you check it out. But I do believe understanding and being able to work with this layout protocol is going to do wonders for you as a Swift UI developer. 
Up next, we have an article from Bright Digit, and this answers a very common question, especially for maybe lesser experienced developers. Uh, they're not quite sure what backend to use or, or how to use it. So this goes through the common scenarios, right? Is the best backend actually no backend at all? Basically, like, are you sure you need a backend? And so it goes through that. You know, what is the purpose of your app, MVP or enterprise, and other you know questions? What devices will support? complex versus simple queries, right? There is a lot of variables that go into choosing the best backend for you. And then they go into the options, hosting a server for your backend, you know, CloudKit, Firebase. I know I get the most questions about Firebase. Everyone wants to use Firebase. And again, the pros and cons of each. Long story short, if you are in this boat where you're thinking you have an app idea, but you're not exactly sure how to handle a backend, this is a great article to check out. Every few episodes, I love to touch on this topic of duplication or, you know, dry, don't repeat yourself. Very common. You know, we've all heard it. I just believe a lot of people take those like sayings or rules of thumb to the extreme and follow them like to the T. That's not the way to do it. And here we have an article from Jason Sweat about duplication. And it really makes a, a nice definition that, to be honest, I hadn't heard before where it says what, what duplication is. Here it is. Duplication is where there's a single behavior that's specified in two or more places. And I like this clarification. Just because two identical pieces of code are present doesn't necessarily mean that's duplication. And just because they're not identical pieces of code means there isn't duplication, right? Because they could be doing the same behavior even though they're different code. And I like this line too. Two pieces of code could happen to be identical, but if they actually serve different purposes and lead separate lives, I like that, lead separate lives, because I kind of use something similar when I'm explaining it myself, then they don't represent the same behavior and they you know, don't constitute duplication. You know? So don't dry that up, as he says. Anyway, I highly recommend checking out this article. Very uh, informative, especially again for the inexperienced developers out there who if they see two pieces of code that look the same, they immediately abstract them away. And a good way to sum that up is this article here, which again, I recommend reading. You know, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. That's a very common saying. But they walk through a little story here that you know really hit home for me. And I think many of us have been here, right? Programmer A sees a duplication. Programmer A extracts that duplication and gives it a name. This creates a new abstraction. Programmer A replaces the duplication with the new abstraction. Ah, the code is perfect. Programmer A is happy. And that's fine. <laughs> Part one of the story is fine, but it never stays that way, right? Time passes. A new requirement appears, which the current abstraction is almost perfect. So programmer B, totally different person, gets tasked to implement this requirement. Programmer B feels honor bound. We're gonna talk about that in a second. To retain the existing abstraction, but since it doesn't quite fit perfectly, right, what do you do? Let me add a parameter to this function and then do some things conditionally within the function based on that parameter. What was once a universal abstraction now behaves differently for different cases. And then the cycle basically repeats. Another requirement arrives, another programmer comes in. Now you add another parameter. And before you know it, you got like three or four parameters on this abstraction that just makes it, right here you go. Here's, here's the perfect summary. You appear in the story about here and your life takes a dramatic turn for the worst. And this is what I want you to leave with here, right? Existing code exerts a powerful influence. Its very presence argues that it is both correct and necessary. And what this means is, you know, like I've come into existing code bases as a contractor or whatever, and you, you know, don't want to mess with existing working code, especially in production. You're like, well, this is here for a reason. It's working. I don't want to like rip it apart and, and make it better if I need to add something to this feature. So, you know, I, basically I can kind of see where this happens, right? Where programmer B will just add a small little parameter and adjust it slightly because they don't want to ruffle too many feathers, right? And that's why, you know, existing code exerts a powerful influence. Anyway, I know I've gone on kind of a little rant. I could probably talk about this for another 10 minutes. As I not make this episode long, highly recommend reading both of these articles, this duplication article and this, you know, uh, duplication is cheaper than the wrong abstraction. Understanding these concepts is very important as a developer. Next, I wanted to quickly share Functional Programming 101. This is by Cassidy Williams here. Uh, I believe this is a GitHub blog. This has nothing to do with Swift and iOS development. However, I wanted to share this, you know, basics of functional programming, like, because it, it starts from the basics, right? What is functional programming? What are the, the pretty much basic rules of functional programming? You know, data is immutable, functions are stateless. Because the reason I wanna talk about functional programming is if you're new to Swift or you're kind of new to this world, functional programming is a pretty popular subgenre of iOS development in Swift. You will see a lot of projects and a lot of job postings we use functional programming. So while it's not like overly dominant in the Swift and iOS space, it's not super niche either. It's, it's pretty prevalent. So I wanted to share this in case you are completely unfamiliar with what functional programming is, so you can get an introduction into the concept. Moving on, let's talk about accessibility. I have a collection of tweets here from Daniel, and when I say a collection, 
it's a collection. <laughs> There's well over a hundred of them. So if you're not super familiar with accessibility or you want to brush up on them, Daniel here has a bunch of tweets, again, over a hundred. And what I like about them is many of them, not all of them, but most of them have a nice hand-drawn diagram to go with the concept you're learning. So definitely bookmark this link, peruse through it. it might take you <laughs> more than one sitting because it is a lot and it's a lot to take in. But like I said, you get the nice hand-drawn images to really emphasize the point. And like I said, we're on day eight, day nine. And if I scroll super far, just take my word for it. There's a uh, there's over a hundred of them. Here is day 40. Definitely a great asset for those that want to improve the accessibility of their apps, which should be all of us. Next, we have a tweet from Ivars here, and we're going to talk about learning multiple different languages versus, you know, trying to focus on one. Because I think a lot of people try to jump to the new, hot, trendy language every three months, or, you know, a friend tells them they should learn something different, and they're constantly, like, changing languages. There is something to be said about trying each one out and seeing what you like, but what Ivars is responding here is this tweet, right? If you want to get a job as a developer, pick one technology you like and focus on it instead of worrying about the job market. Because I hear that all the time when people ask me for advice. It's like, I don't care what I do, I just want to get a job the fastest. And I understand everyone's financial situation is different, so maybe getting a job is very dire. But for the most part, in the long run, working on a technology that you enjoy or you like or you're interested in, it's going to be way better for you because as developers, pretty much no matter what language, what platform, you're going to be in demand. So I always say work on something you like. What Ivars is saying is the common beginner's mistake is to learn multiple different programming languages. Jumping between niches is just slowing you down. And I agree so much so that I tweeted this out now more pertinent to iOS developers. Britt Codes here, who's working with me on Creator View, says the infinite loop. Every time I decide to go all in and learn everything Swift UI, I feel like I'm missing out by not learning more UI kit. And when I decide to go all in on UI kit, I feel like I'm missing out on getting ahead by focusing on Swift UI. And here's my response, similar to what Ivars was saying. In late 2022, a beginner iOS dev will be fine either way. I truly believe that. Whether you go all in on UI kit, you'll be fine. You can make it work. Whether you go all in on Swift UI, you'll be fine. You can make it work, right? That's why I said both paths can work. The bigger mistake is trying to learn both at the same time especially with SwiftUI and UIKit, because those are two different ways of thinking. That's imperative programming versus declarative programming. I can't even imagine as a beginner, like learning to code and program is hard enough as it is as a very beginner, let alone trying to learn imperative and declarative at the same time. Like I said, trying to learn both at the same time, that's just gonna stunt your growth. Pick a path, go all in, learn the other one later. So that's the lesson here. If you're bouncing between technologies or bouncing between languages or even within the world of iOS development, you're bouncing between UIKit and SwiftUI, just pick one and focus on it. I believe you'll be much better off that way. Here we have a thread from Via, uh, self-taught devs, tell me your success stories. So again, this is geared towards people that are just trying to break into this world. And this <laughs> tweet kind of blew up because there are hundreds of success stories here. So maybe going through this thread, you'll hear other people's stories and get motivated because I know it can be discouraging when you're trying to get that first job, you're just learning programming. So here are literally a couple hundred success stories. Bear in mind, there is such thing as survivorship bias, right? I, I haven't gone and read through every, all hundred plus of them, but you know, these are the ones that were successful. There's probably hundreds that gave up and didn't succeed. So I do want, just want to put that out there. But this is a very motivating thread if you are in that position, hearing everyone's situations, how they learned, how long it took them to get a job, etc. And speaking of getting that job, I know I've kind of been on this topic for a little bit here, but there was a lot of good articles this month talking about it. So Daniela here has getting your first job as a junior developer. And the reason I wanted to point this out, well, once she tells her story, which is unique, you know, the typical resume stuff you experience, but she also focuses on the stuff you have to do aside from just applying. Because I think so many people think, I'm just gonna go to the website, apply, and I'll get a job. In 2022, there's way better ways to do that, right? So a portfolio, like Daniela says, networking, right? Twitter, you know, one day I came across a video by me uh, where he suggested developers create a Twitter account. You know, she had never had a Twitter account. And then she realized just the network on here, getting involved, sharing your work, going to meetups and conferences. Like in 2022, doing all this extra stuff is the way, the best way to get a job. Can you apply on a website and get lucky? Sure. But man, having a portfolio, getting involved in the community, building in public, sharing your work, interacting with people, building that network, that is the way to do it. This quick little quadrant chart by Yanni, I think says so much with so little. What I took away from this, and I think it might've been somewhere down in the comments that I was reading through that they said this, but they said, the work has to be done somewhere. And that's what stuck with me. So basically what this says is like, to write bad code, 
Right, writing the bad code is easy, but reading the bad code is hard. We've all been there. However, writing the good code is easy, but once you've put in the time and the effort and done that work to write the good code, reading it in the future, in theory, right, is easy. So again, what stuck with me was the work has to be done at some time. Either the reader of your spaghetti crap code is gonna do the work, or you're going to do the work to write it. And you, being the one that write it, that understands the problem, that knows what's going on, it's better that you put in the work to make it good so the reader, who maybe doesn't have all the context, can come in later, has it easier. But regardless, someone's gotta do the work. So when you write shitty, bad code, you're just pushing off that work to someone else later, and uh, you're gonna regret that. On to the indie dev portion of the show here. Apple featured uh, Curtis Herbert's uh, Slopes app, very popular app, uh, very, very well known, got an Apple Design Award. But again, if you are building an app, you're building a product, I highly recommend running through this article. You get all the backstory. What I wanna point out here is, I'm gonna scroll down to this line, cause I love this, right? Um, scroll down, again, you're getting the whole story, the background, here it is, here it is. I get to cheat, cause this is how I feel when I build Creator View, right? Creating designs for your hobby can be a huge time saver. And this is something to keep in mind if you're thinking about a product to build. You don't have to do it this way, but it does feel like you're cheating, right? It says, I get to cheat a little because I'm the snowboarder, I'm the designer, I'm the developer, I'm the product manager. That's kind of how I feel, except I'm the YouTuber, I'm the designer, I'm the developer, I'm the product manager. Snowboarders or skiers, probably don't know what's possible from the technical perspective, most likely. Whereas engineers might just try to go the default way. So when you combine your hobby with this magical superpower that we have of being in, uh, engineers, developers, whatever you want to call it, that can build an app, and you combine those, it does, it does feel like cheating. So I wanted to point out that little bit, but again, overall, it's just the story of this very successful indie app by Curtis here, and I highly recommend checking it out. Next, we have an article from Revenue Cat on what is a good monthly renewal rate? So as you know, subscriptions are very prevalent with apps. Most indie devs and most companies, that is how they're earning revenues. But you need to know your renewal rate because it's like having a leaky bucket. You wanna fix that leaky bucket before you focus on pouring more water into it. So knowing your renewal rate, and it's called churn, and then also knowing like what is a good renewal rate. So that's where this article comes in to basically give you uh, an idea of what's good. Because if your renewal rate is not good, Fix that, fix the leaky bucket before you try and go out and get new customers. Cause there's no point in throwing a bunch of water into a leaky bucket, right? So hopefully this article will help you determine like, okay, what, what is a good monthly renewal rate for my app? This is just a quick fun trip down memory lane here. Nick Babich design talks about Aqua. This look probably dominated a lot of our childhoods looking at this, but cool Aqua, that's cool and all. But I love this, right? The brief history of Apple Macintosh OS. Cause I was around during this era as well. It dates me, I'm, not gonna, I'm 40, I'll just say it. But yeah, I grew up on that in elementary school looking at that. But like I said, it's just a fun trip down memory lane, seeing the evolution of how our beloved Mac OS and Macs have evolved over time. So that's a fun little article. Next, let's talk about design a little bit. As a designer, you've probably learned and heard that people don't read. This is true, but I think a better saying is you have to make people read. This is a sign on a door here saying, hey, this is for private residences. But you have this nice styled thing. Ah, people aren't reading that. Even right next to the button, you have private residences, no hotel access, people still push it. So you just smack a piece of paper right there. They're gonna read that. So. Again, it's a little bit tongue in cheek here, but you know, if you're designing your user interfaces, like sometimes you have to make people read just because it looks good and might not be the best way. And you know, people just skim screens. Like I said, people don't read. There's also a thread to go along with this to explain it, check it out. But I just thought that was funny that yeah, just slap a piece of paper right there. That'll, <laughs> that'll be the most effective. Moving on to AR corner here, right? I've been featuring what Shopify is doing because they're doing a lot of cool stuff. So reverse AR. So basically you wrap a virtual room around a new space. And this is based on like the new iOS 16 stuff where you can like hold on it and it'll pull that image out, right? It kind of erases all the background. And then you just put that into a virtual room so you can test your real furniture in a virtual room. So like I said, I've been featuring Shopify, what they're doing with AR the past couple episodes. Uh, they're doing some pretty cool stuff. I, I like it. And finally, the LOL of the month. If you wanna finish and launch this side project, you're actually gonna to need to handle the errors, forgot password functionality, form validation, testing, monitoring, rate limiting, all the boring stuff. I call it like the second 90%. I've done a video about that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I know, I know I gotta do all that. That's just, I don't know, it made me laugh because side projects are fun until you gotta do that real nitty gritty work. All right, that wraps up this month's episode. We'll see you in the next one.